Father, most of us are in this place tonight because you have redeemed us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who you sent into this world to rescue us from our sins, to pay the price, to set us free. And Lord, tonight we stand here in your presence singing this song because it's true in our lives. And we ask tonight that through your mercy, through your grace, through your love, and through your truth, that you would continue to set us free and we would experience that redemption personally and powerfully. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Genesis. If you don't have a Bible uh, uh, with you or a Bible app on your device, then grab one of those in the pews around you. They look just like this one. And in fact, uh, it's page 55. That's where we're turning to. Genesis 50, uh, which is uh, 55 in these Bibles. Hey, uh, in the, doesn't the stage look great with all this stuff on it? The, uh, uh, you know, some places actually get upset when kids make a mess. Here, we just think it's awesome that we have children to make a mess with. And, uh, and so uh, we just rejoice in this because, after all, this is just stuff. But those kids, those boys and girls, they last forever. And, uh, and this stuff, eh, it cleans up, sort of, kind of. We don't care. We're going to trash it for the Passion Play in a couple weeks anyway. So, uh, so we, can, uh, we can have fake snot on it all we want. Hey, uh, what would you do? What would you do if your adversaries, you know, the people who had hurt you the most in life, who had caused you great pain, who had done it intentionally, what would you do if your adversaries were suddenly and unexpectedly at your mercy? You held the power of freedom or imprisonment, literally of life and death, of blessing or cursing, of, of justice or mercy. What would you do? Uh, tonight we're concluding our family tree series. We've been uh, looking at the crazy dysfunctional family life of this guy named Joseph. Uh, this is Old Testament Joseph from uh, about 16, 1800 B.C. Uh, and and uh, we've been learning about his family and learning about our families and how God redeems. And the main thought I want you to, to think about tonight is this. A healthy family tree must be rooted in mercy. A healthy family tree. We've been talking about dysfunctional family trees and how messed up we can be and those things that sabotage us and destroy us. And I want you to know that if you want to have a healthy family tree, then it's got to be rooted in mercy. So here's the question I'd ask. Is grace, is mercy, is forgiveness part of your family fabric? Is it how you relate to one another? On a daily basis? Is it how you live your lives? Is it uh, the way that you love? Uh, I guess, in a sense, what I'm asking is does your family tree bear the fruit of forgiveness or does it produce a harvest of anger and rage and bitterness and revenge? In other words, when you're together and you're hanging out as a family, whatever that looks like, uh, are you still bringing up the pain of the past and fighting about it? Or is it a time of joyful celebration? Um, and, and as we dive into the story, please know the choices of one person can influence generations towards mercy. The choices of just one person can influence generations toward mercy. And, and I want you to realize you can be that person. Everyone in this room can be that person. We see this in Joseph's choice of forgiveness. Now, we're in Genesis 50, which is the last chapter in Genesis, and it concludes Joseph's story. And we're going to look at this in just a moment, uh, the passage that, that this is in here. But let me catch you up on the story of Joseph. You may know it really well. You may not. So here's what's been happening these last few weeks as we looked at his life. Joseph was born into a huge family. Uh, his dad, Jacob, uh, whom God changed the name of Jacob to Israel, He's the guy that the whole nation is named after, right? So, got this? So, he had 12 sons. Ten of them were older than Joseph. So, Joseph was number 11 out of 12. And his older brothers were so fond of Joseph that they plotted to kill him. Seriously. 
They were going to kill him. And, and instead of killing him, they sold him into slavery. So he went down to Egypt. He got sold to a guy named Potiphar. And there in Potiphar's household, he rose to prominence as the chief slave over all the other slaves. And, and he was doing really well in that until one day Mrs. Potiphar uh, decided that she wanted to have him in the biblical sense. And, uh, and so she tried to seduce Joseph, and, and he said no. And so she accused him of attempted rape. Uh, and so because of that false accusation, he got thrown into prison where, once again, God was with Joseph in prison and Joseph rose to be the top prisoner in prison. Yay. He was the chief, you know, uh, of the trustees. And so he was running the prison and, and he was there for a number of years. And, and a couple of really influential guys got dropped into prison and, and, and Joseph, you know, uh, kind of helped him out. And he said, just do one thing for me. Just remember me when you get out of here. And they didn't. They forgot him. And so he continued in prison for years, and, and, and finally Pharaoh had this dream no one could interpret, and Pharaoh is the king of Egypt, and, and he hears about Joseph, and Joseph gets brought out, and he interprets Pharaoh's dream, and he gets promoted to the second in command of the most powerful nation at the time. And, and so there he is, he's running Egypt, and, and he's, for seven years there was this great plenty in the land, and he gathered in all the excess crops and stored them, because after that there were seven years of terrible famine. And because of Joseph's wisdom and because of his leadership, there was food for the people of Egypt and others that came looking for food. Well, guess who came looking for food? Joseph's family ran out of food in Palestine. And so the, the brothers came down. The ten older brothers came down because as Joseph's dad uh, wasn't about to lose his other son, Benjamin. Remember, Joseph's dad, Jacob, thinks that he's dead. Thinks that Joseph is dead. And... and uh, and the brothers come to buy food, and they got to go to Joseph to get food. Only they don't know it's Joseph. They don't have a clue that it's Joseph. And, and, and after all, he's dressed like an Egyptian. They haven't seen him in probably 20 to 30 years. They don't know it's him. He was just a young pup when, when they sold him as a slave. And, and so they come before Joseph, and, and they ask for food. And he recognizes his brothers, and he tests his brothers. After all, these are the guys that sold him into slavery. And now Joseph has the power to destroy them or to feed them. Well, he tests them and he finds out that, you know what, they, they actually care about their, their little brother, his little brother, Benjamin. And, and they're willing to sacrifice themselves to protect Benjamin and to protect their dad. And, and that they're not going to do the same type of things. In other words, he sees that they have changed their hearts. And so after a, a couple of really big tests... <laughs> And Joseph is sure of this. He can't stand it anymore, and he tells his brothers who he is. And they are shocked and amazed and scared to death and all these kinds of things because their brother can kill him now. He's got all that power. Instead, what he does is he says, hey, is my dad still alive? Then bring him down. Bring the whole family down. They move the whole clan of all of his, his dad and his, and his brothers and all their families down to Egypt, and, and they get taken care of by Joseph uh, and... Uh, and they stay there for years, living under his care and under his provision. And then we get to chapter 50, and dad dies. Right? Jacob has been alive all this time, and Jacob uh, passes away, and the brothers freak out. And let's pick up in, in verse 15 of Genesis chapter 50. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. They recognized that they were kind of bad. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. They're, they're using their dad's name in vain, right? Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and for their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept. When they spoke to him, his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Wow. We see Joseph's choice of forgiveness. Joseph had the power to harm his brothers, but he chose to forgive. 
He, he had the power to destroy them, but he decided to bless them and to build their lives and build their families. And when Joseph chose mercy, a family was redeemed. His family was redeemed. Broken relationships were healed, and God was honored. You see, his family was redeemed because this is the family that God brought Messiah into the world that we just sang about. The Messiah who saved us, who redeemed us. In other words, Joseph's choice of forgiveness is still having positive impact today. Wow. Now, I share that with you because I also want you to know that God heals our lives and relationships through mercy. God heals our lives and our relationships through mercy. We see it in Joseph's example. He set that example of what it looks like to forgive even when you can destroy, when you have that power. And of course, we know that the Bible tells us to forgive over and over and over again. It's a recurring theme, right? Paul says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And of course, Jesus taught us to pray, what? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Or forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It doesn't matter which word you use. The principle is the same. Hey, God, I want to be forgiven like I forgive. Because you forgave me all my sin. I want to forgive them all their sin against me. Now, we pray that, and we know what the Bible says about it, and we see Joseph's example in doing this. But do we get it that God's power flows through acts of forgiveness? Now, now realize the greatest act of forgiveness was Jesus' death on the cross, and God's power flows through Jesus to you and to me to forgive us of our sins. And we remember that when we celebrate communion. We remember that when we sing the songs, celebrating our forgiveness, celebrating our redemption. See, the greatest act of God's power flowed through forgiveness. Same way in our lives. When we forgive, when we step into these acts of forgiveness, then God shows up in power in our lives and he begins to heal us and he heals relationships. Here's how. First of all, God blesses you when you forgive. I don't know if you realize this or not, but forgiveness is for you. When God tells you to forgive someone else, it's because he wants to bless you. Maybe you knew that, maybe you didn't know that. I want you to think about this. Anger and unforgiveness and bitterness is like a poison for your soul. If you just think about the people who've hurt you all the time, if you fixate on them, it destroys your life. You've got no joy, you've got no peace, and you just rot on the inside. It just tears you up. Forgiveness is God's antidote to that bitterness and poison in our soul. In other words, instead of fixating on the pain that someone caused you, you get to focus on the forgiveness of Christ for you and you passing that on to them. And what is something that was toxic and destructive in your life now becomes a point of praise because God has forgiven you and you've passed that on to them. And God cleanses your soul of that, that nasty junk that's in there, that anger, that bitterness, and that just, just washes away in forgiveness. And you can have joy, real joy in your life. See, God blesses you when you forgive. That's one way that he blesses you. The second is simply this. God rewards our obedience when we forgive. See, every time that we obey God, he gets excited about that and he rewards us. Now, sometimes that's tangible, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you can see the direct link, sometimes you can't. In Joseph's case, do you know what God did to him? You know how God blessed him? When, when Jacob was uh, handing out the blessings to his boys before he died, Joseph got a double portion in the promised land. He got twice as much as all of his brothers because of his obedience to God and, and allowing God to use him in, in, uh, in all those places he'd been. Because he was a person of integrity, because he was a person of mercy, he got a double, a double portion, a double blessing. Now, when you choose to forgive, when you're a person of mercy, I'm not saying God's going to give you twice as much of whatever it is you want. I'm just going to say God's going to bless you, and you need to know that, because God blesses you when you forgive. And then God blesses others through your mercy. Now, now uh, 
it's obvious sometimes because like Joseph's brothers, you know, they thought he might kill us or throw us in prison or sell us as slaves, all those things we did to him, right? But instead, they were blessed because of Joseph's mercy. And not just they were blessed, but we were blessed because of it too. Because he chose to show mercy, like I said, it was the nation was continued and, and that was the nation that Jesus was brought into this world through. He was of the tribe of Judah. That's why sometimes we call Jesus the Lion of Judah because that was his line. Judah was one of Joseph's brothers. Imagine if he just wiped them all out, the kind of messed up that would be. See, God worked through that to bless others. And, and it's the same in our lives. When you forgive, then others have an opportunity to lay down their shame and guilt that they've been carrying around. See, what you're saying to them is, hey, it's okay. You can go ahead and put those burdens down. You don't have to live in that prison of failure and shame anymore. I, I, I give you permission to leave it. You don't have to say those words, but when you say, I forgive you, that's what happens. Because when you really extend forgiveness to somebody, then, then they, don't, they don't have to carry that guilt anymore. And so God blesses others through your mercy, and then God redeems families who practice forgiveness. Hey, he, he really does. There's nothing more painful than brokenness in our homes. Just nothing. Nothing. Uh, we see the damage, uh, you know, between a husband and wife when it's manifest in divorce. We see the damage that happens with the kids. We see damage that's present when siblings are estranged or when parents and children don't talk. You know, when there's that years and decades that go by between conversations or, or you're living life and you haven't seen your grandkids or your kids haven't seen your parents. That hurts us. That, that breaks us. But, but when we embrace forgiveness as a choice and a lifestyle... Understand, forgiveness can't be something you do just one time in one place. Forgiveness is something that you've got to decide to do all the time, every place, in those little moments, so that when you come to the big moments, you can choose mercy. Because if you're not choosing mercy in the little moments, you're not going to choose it in the big moments. And, and so when we do that, then God heals the brokenness, not always of the relationships that, that are in the families, but he heals the brokenness of the one who's seeking forgiveness. He heals our hearts, changes us. He doesn't put all the pieces back together, but he shows up in a powerful way and he redeems. He redeems our families. We see this in the life of Joseph and the choice that he made and how we're the recipients of that, that blessing. And we see it in the lives of those around us if we look for it. You know, there's more mercy and forgiveness happening all around you. You just got to open your eyes and see it. And hopefully you're seeing it a lot. Uh, and if not, then we want to help you see it because one of the things I get to do is I get to hear people's stories of mercy and forgiveness. And I want to share one of those with you tonight. Here's the. Hi, I'm Scott Horton, and this is my wife, Chris. And we just want to share a story of how God is working in our life. Scott and I actually met in high school and we started dating our junior year. Um, when we were both seniors, um, we had made some poor choices and I discovered that I was pregnant. And then we had the joy of telling our parents. Having grown up in church since I was a baby, I knew I had disappointed my parents and uh, tried to put off the conversation as long as I could. But Chris and her mom and I sat down with my parents and shared the information with them, and it was the hardest conversation I ever had. I'm Carol, I'm Scott's mother, and Scott had made an appointment for him and Chris to come and tell us something, so we of course imagined all kinds of things that they might be telling us, but they came with Chris's mother as well, and told us that Chris was pregnant and the baby would be born in July. And it was a very difficult time for the whole family because we had hopes of college and all of that for Scott. But we got the most blessed little girl and she grew up to be a fine young lady at 24 years old today. As a parent, we all like our children to be perfect, but they never are. And we have to accept the things that happen. We still have to love them, teach them, and forgive them. Shortly after Brianna was born, we got engaged and married. We wanted to make sure we were getting married for the right reasons. Um, a few years later, we had another son. 
and uh, another few years we had our third child, Brett, and um, I was youth pastoring in a church and everything was going great, and then one day in May our world was rocked. Uh, from the very beginning, Brett was just a really happy baby. I mean, even from the delivery, the delivery was very peaceful. Um, and he was always happy and smiling and joyful. I'd go into his bedroom every morning and he wouldn't even be crying. I would just see him uh, with a blanket over his head and he'd just be laughing. And that's how I'd know he was awake in the morning, is he would just be laughing in his crib. Um, it, even when we taught him how to walk, we had just passed a piece of licorice back and forth and he would run after it. And that's how he learned to walk. Chris and I both had jobs and my parents had recently semi-retired and they had their RV on uh, our property and they helped us out a lot with the kids. And uh, that morning they were babysitting the kids and getting them ready for school. I remember it being a really difficult morning for me to get off to work. Um, even Brett had taken the toilet paper in the bathroom and had spread it all over the bathroom and he had flung it over his head. and. He was kind of laughing and looking at me like, did I do something wrong? And it was just kind of funny. So it was just really hard for me to get out of the house that morning. It was 18 years ago today, or this year, and it's still as fresh in my mind as it was way back then. Little Brett was staying with us and the other children as well too. We were getting them ready to catch the bus and little Brett wanted to go help his grandpa load the truck for work. So they went out and loaded the truck and then they came back inside. And little Brett loved to be outside and he wanted to go with his grandpa, so he didn't want to stay inside anymore. So we took him outside and kissed grandpa goodbye. And then he and I went to put his car, the car seat into my car. And while I was removing the seat belts from under the car, under the seat, Little Brett slipped away, running right into the path of the loaded truck while I was backing up. When I moved my head out from the car, when I realized he was gone, I heard the noise and I ran and picked little Brett up. And of course we ran right to the phone and called and then we got in the car and drove him to the hospital because we weren't able to reach anybody. And when we got to the hospital, they told us little Brett had died instantly upon impact. When I finally did get to work, um, I hadn't been there very long. And I remember getting a phone call, the one that we, that we all hate to get. And it was Scott's dad. And he had told me that my son had been hit by a car. And um, I had a lot of people ask me if they could help me and drive me to the hospital. And I remember just grabbing my keys and rushing out and heading down the highway. There was one point on the highway, I was about 15 minutes from the hospital and I just felt my heart just kind of fall into my stomach and I knew that he was gone. And um, I just had to start crying out to God to help me get through the rest of that, that moment. Well, I was able to get there a lot earlier than Chris because my job site was just a few minutes away. And um, as soon as I got there, they told me he was gone. And I was just devastated in my grief and just looking for Chris. Um, I remember getting to the hospital and running into the emergency room and the nurse there took me off to the side. And instead of bringing me into the hospital room where I thought my son would be, she brought me into a room off to the side. And uh, when I got there, my entire family was there, Scott's parents, him, some of our um, sisters and brothers that had gotten there before me. And they all told me that Brett had passed away. Um, I remember feeling my heart just drop into my stomach and I couldn't breathe anymore. I couldn't catch my breath. So I went outside to get some air. And while I was outside, I was just crying out to God and asking him to help me to get through this moment and he told me to go back in there and tell those grandparents that I forgive them. And I remember saying to the Lord, I said, Lord, I can't do that. I just found out that my son died. I can do that later, but I cannot do that right now. I can hardly breathe. And he said, no, I want you to do that now. 
I said, so I said, okay, I will. And I went back into the hospital room and I knelt before Wayne and Carol. And I don't remember my exact words, but I remember telling them that I forgive them. I trust them with my other kids. And I know they're good grandparents and they love my kids more than anything. And then I remember saying, I forgive you. That day was such a blur, and I don't really know what anybody said, but I know that Chris forgave me and Scott, and God was there picking me up all the time. And to this day, I've still got the forgiveness of the kids and the happy family that we so cherish, and such a blessing. You know, some people ask me how we could forgive something like that, but honestly, how can you not forgive after what Christ did for us? How can you not forgive after what Christ has forgiven us? Uh, Scott and Chris are here uh, tonight, and uh, they're going to be available after the service. And if you're struggling with forgiveness, um, they'll be here to minister to you. Uh, and uh, so just know that, that uh, a, felt, a healthy family tree has to be rooted in mercy. And that's one picture of what a healthy family tree looks like. So you have to decide, are you going to forgive or are you going to destroy? Because it's your decision. Are you going to forgive or are you going to destroy? It's really simple. You can live a life of bitterness and anger and revenge. And if you do that, you'll destroy your family. You'll kill the joy in your household and you'll drive your family away from you, at least relationally, even if not physically. Or you can live a life of mercy, realizing that God has forgiven you, and so you choose to forgive others no matter what. And if you do that, then God's going to redeem. He's going to build. Because whatever you meant evil against me, God means it for good. Joseph spoke those words to his brothers who had tried to kill him, who tried to sell him into slavery, and he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And, and it doesn't matter whether the people who've hurt you have done it intentionally or unintentionally. Here's the thing. If we'll follow the path of mercy, God redeems it. But if we hold on to that anger and that unforgiveness, then we destroy us and the people that we care about. So tonight, who do you need to forgive? Chris said that God told her to go inside and tell those grandparents that you forgive them. She didn't want to do it, but she did it. Scott told me that was the bravest thing he'd ever seen anyone do. Tonight, who is God telling you to forgive? Who is it that has hurt you, that you've got that dark place in your heart that is poisoning your soul, that you're holding on to that bitterness and that rage and that anger, and sometimes you fantasize about getting even? Who is it that you need to forgive? Is it a spouse or an ex-spouse? Is it your, one of your parents or one of your children? Is it a friend or a business partner or a rival? Who's God telling you to forgive? And who do you need to ask forgiveness from? Who is it that you have wronged and you need to go to them and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. And let's start with the obvious one. Have you asked God to forgive you? Because Jesus Christ has already told you what his answer is. His answer is yes, I will forgive you. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us. Of all unrighteousness. Tonight, have you come to that place where you've said, Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God, the Savior of the world, that you died on the cross to pay for my sins, and, and that you were risen from the dead, and I'm committing my life to follow you. Please forgive me. 
If not, then let your journey following Christ begin now. Because he will receive you with open arms. He will forgive you. But who else? Who else is it that you need to say I'm sorry to? Who is God laying on your heart? Because here's the thing. In just a moment, we're going to celebrate communion. We're going to remember Christ's forgiveness of us. His sacrifice. His death. His resurrection. His body broken for us. His blood shed for us. And we're going we're to remember that. Who is it that you need to ask forgiveness of? Because my prayer is that you'll leave this place and you'll get on the phone or you'll drive to their house and you will say those hardest words and yet most powerful words, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And even if they say no, God's still going to show up and bless you. Because that's what he does when we step in to mercy. Forgive or destroy. If you choose forgiveness, God's going to bless, he's going to redeem. But if you choose anger and bitterness, then you will destroy your own life. I pray tonight and always that you choose mercy. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the grace that you give us in Jesus. We know we don't deserve it. And you had the power to condemn and yet instead you chose to sacrifice yourself for us. And so tonight, Lord, we pray that you would teach us how to be merciful. You'd show us how to forgive. You would give us the strength and the courage to step out into that place where some of us have never been to ask somebody else to forgive us. Lord, we need you to show us how to do this. Even as we celebrate your mercy, teach us how to give it. In Jesus' name. Amen.